for cancer research? Ah, yes, thank you. <laughs> so he, um, Eric has been, has been in, I would say, by informatics for um, many years now and in computer science even more years. So uh, he will be talking today about, about digital twins in cancer. So, I mean, please uh, raise your hand and have, uh, ask questions whenever you want. And people online write your questions or also raise hands so that we can know that you want to uh, ask something. So yeah, with further ado, Eric, what is yours? All right. Thank you, Arnau. Thank you everyone for the opportunity to speak with you today and share some information about some exciting developments that we have at Frederick National Lab in the context of uh, digital twins for, in biomedicine. Uh, Arnaud mentioned that I've been in bioinformatics for a while. I started in bioinformatics about 2001. Uh, my background before that was actually in computer science and computational chemistry. So uh, about that time, it was becoming evident that biology was an exciting context for the chemistry that I had a background in. And so I jumped into bioinformatics uh, without much of a biology background. So for the past many years, I've been learning a lot from experts, uh, bringing what I would say is a, na a naive perspective to many of those experts about what can be done uh, from a computational and a chemistry perspective. And over the past 20 years, it's been exciting to see the convergence of the computing and the chemistry and the biology, which really does become manifest in in Frederick, or excuse me, in uh, the biomedical digital twins. And so that's what I'll be talking to you about today. Uh, so a little bit about the items that we'll talk through today. I'll give them to give you some foundations for the innovations that we have with biomedical digital twins, their computing and other types of foundations. We'll focus a little bit on the biomedical digital twins. We'll have a, essentially a use case that we look at for treatment optimization where we see the convergence of activities do, being undertaken in AI for drug discovery, how those converge with digital twins, and then we're gonna save some time for discussion. There will be actually quite a few slides, but hopefully that will keep it interesting. Uh, so here we go. The acknowledgements are, I usually put up front. All the work that we're talking about here has been really done by teams beyond me. I've, my role has been really to uh, work with the others, identify ideas and build communities around those ideas. Uh, so you can see many organizations are involved, the National Cancer Institute, the Department of Energy, Frederick National Lab for Cancer Research, uh, five Department of Energy National Labs have been involved, and those have formed various collaborative teams for ADAM, for jdax for c which is an acronym which stands for the Joint Design of Advanced Computing Solutions for Cancer. There will not be a quiz at the end of the presentation, so you don't have to remember that. Uh, NCIDOE collaborations and many others that have been contributing to, uh, to these ideas that you'll be hearing about today. A little bit about the foundations for innovation here. Frederick National Lab for Cancer Research, giving a, an interesting and, and really an op a fun place to get to know and work with. I will say that my first experience working with Frederick National Lab was in the early 90s. So this is before I was into bioinformatics and biology. Uh, when I was working at Cray Research, uh, Cray, the FFRDC and Frederick actually had a large Cray system. So they were a customer. And I actually had the opportunity to be supporting some of the scientists at Frederick National Lab while I was working at Cray. So they've been around for quite a while, but it is the only federally funded research and development center devoted exclusively to biomedical research. And there's many other federally funded research and development centers within the United States. This is the one that's focused uh, exclusively on biomedical research, and it's in the Department of Health and Human Services. The two primary campuses are located in Fort Detrick, Maryland, where it was uh, originally established. Uh, and then uh, it does have an advanced technology research facility that was developed and built a few years ago to provide an off-base presence uh, and some opportunity for growth there. In addition, scientists from Frederick National Lab actually are dispersed in many places around the country, but primarily in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, those employees, there's about 2,300 of them or more. Uh, they cover that whole spectrum of what you might expect in an FFRDC, a federally funded research and development center that focuses on biomedical research. There's facilities for doing the animal science and supporting those activities. There's bioinformatics and IT support. Uh, so the comments earlier, informatics and computational science have been a history in Frederick for many, many years, for 30 plus years. Uh, they do basic translational and clinical research. So what's interesting, 
to know is there's actually a vaccine ma manufacturing plant within the context of the national lab. So it not only can actually perform the experiments, it can create the components that are needed for the experiments. That vaccine plan has become helpful, certainly in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, response, but also in other emerging health uh, pandemics and, and, and epidemics, uh, working with Ebola, HIV, Zika, and others. And then the other things that the the National Lab looks at is advanced technologies, comp computing being one of those, and NCI national missions. I'm not going to go over all of those, but suffice to say, there's a lot of activity at Frederick National Lab. So the other part of the foundations for innovations that I wanted to talk about is the essentially the push for exascale. And the, the timeline here essentially begins in about 2015 is when we had uh, earnest discussions with the Department of Energy about how could we take advantage of their growing capabilities for large-scale exascale computing and use that to potentially address some cancer challenges. So that led to that acronym that we talked about earlier, the Joint Design of Advanced Computing Solutions for Cancer, which is a collaboration between the National Cancer Institute and the, and the Department of Energy. But you can see the several level, layers here that we begin to de develop in time. The first focusing on the networking, data transfer, data management, and HPC access, adding to that training, then adding to that those collaborative efforts between scientists and computational scientists, ultimately culminating in capabilities that would be considered exascale challenge cancer science projects about 2018, 2019. And you'll see some of those reflected briefly today. When we start looking off into the future and we go super exascale and so forth, we begin to look at the domain where we envision digital twins. All right, so in 2016, when things were coming together, there was the National Strategic Computing Initiative within the United States. And it basically said that we have a lot of computing we need to advance. There's the traditional physics models that have been the long stay of the Department of Energy, but there's these new data-driven approaches that are becoming very, very prevalent. And so those ultimately had to converge. And that's part of what's led all of this together because in the context of the digital twin, you will see that blending of both the data-driven approaches as well as the model-driven approaches or the, the equation-driven approaches. So a little bit about the overview of this joint design of advanced computing solutions for cancer. Again, it's probably the third time you've heard that, but this gives you an idea of, of what's been involved. It was uh, supported uh, by this convergence of the National Strategic Computing Initiative in the United States and the Precision Medicine Initiative, one generating the data, one actually bringing compute together. You can see that there were four national labs involved, Argonne, Oak Ridge, Lawrence Livermore, and Los Alamos. Uh, the National Cancer Institute Department of Energy were the agency supporters in Frederick National Lab was the, the participant from the, uh, from the National Cancer Institute in this effort. There were really three projects that were identified, one focusing in the preclinical domain, and it was really looking at developing models to predict outcomes of tumors subject to drug treatments and doing data-driven approaches for those. Uh, the second one that you see listed there is looking in the clinical domain and expanding the database of the SEER database, which is some information that you can go access to and publicly. It's, it's surveillance epidemiology and end results database. It's a database essentially of cancer, cancer patient information that is collected and made available for research and expanding that to have more fidelity and doing it more effectively. And then a third area of challenge was the molecular domain is really looking at how we can push the modeling with advanced computing, uh, and in this case, doing multi-scale biological models. And so this has been a project that's been underway, harmonizing with one of the national initiatives that the, uh, the NCI has established, and that is to make progress on RAS-related cancers. Underlying all of this is something that's called the Cancer Distributed Learning Environment, which is a large AI uh, deep learning uh, system that's been co-developed by the national labs in this context, but the, the PI and driver for that is coming out of Argonne National Lab. The individual who leads that effort is Rick Stevens. Uh, another aspect that's an important foundation is that there's we're learning that all sorts of data come together. So going beyond the data that would be used in those three model spaces, we see all sorts of information coming together when we start looking at the future for predictive and precision medicine. It's genomic data we're familiar with. It's clinical data that we're increasingly uh, being incorporating various forms of clinical data, self-reported data, and then putting this all together in 
usable ways. Another aspect of the foundation that's important to know about, I've had some conversations this morning uh, that uh, hopefully this would be of use, is that the NCI has established a, a cancer research data commons. Uh, the cancer research data commons is pulling together the information that the NCI has funded through various grants and putting it into a, a central resource that individuals can access and download information. It started with the genomic data commons because a lot of information had been developed with the Cancer Genome Atlas project, but extended to other aspects. There's a proteomics data commons. Uh, they've stood up an imaging data commons. There's an integrated canine data commons. So essentially creating these commons areas that are taking information that the NCI has supported in their grant efforts and pulling it together for the, the broader public and the community to take advantage of. So knowing that in many cases as data scientists, one of the key things that we need is data. This is a key resource for many of the investigations and things to come. Another aspect that we put as a, as a foundational element is when we start doing model development as data scientists, how do we share the information that we have? How do we make it available? And so the collaborative projects that we talked about with the DOE we wanna make sure that that information is publicly available. These were funded by the Cancer Moonshot activity, which has its, its, its driving uh, uh, guidance is to make the data and results publicly available. So we established the Model and Data Clearinghouse, which is the Predictive Oncology Model and Data Clearinghouse, where we are putting models and data sets for the public to access. And what's important about that is we operate it not just as a repository, but as a clearinghouse. So the data are there, the models are there, and we can continue to qualify models in a growing way, giving more insight into their performance and so forth. It's a reason it has an extensible metadata context to it. We can arbitrarily add new fields that become important and relevant to the models and the data sets over time. And then a little bit more about Candle, since so much of this is driven by AI activities. Again, this is publicly available. You can go download it from GitHub. Uh, and we've had students use this on laptops all the way up to the large exascale systems. Uh, it's designed to be portable and leverage for large scale systems, deep learning technologies that have been developed um, broadly. So it becomes a very integrated environment. And lastly, as we get into this, the, one of the things that we realize as we go forward is building a community. Uh, so we actually established a website to build a community of individuals that are going to be working and talking together. So these are the foundations that we have for the activities that will lead us to the digital twins. So a little bit more about the digital twins. And before I jump into this, I'm gonna pause and ask if there's any questions online or any questions in the room. All right, if there's no questions, we can jump into the digital twins. All right, so what's a digital twin? A digital twin is, very similar to what would be a, a simulation, except there's a couple of differences. So we do a lot of biological simulations and we simulate various systems and so forth. What makes a digital twin distinctive is that it's about a specific instance and it is updated in real time with data about that specific instance. They use digital twins in other domains. They use them in transportation. They use them in manufacturing where you essentially have a digital analog of a real world system that is constantly being updated with sensors and information. So this virtual instance of the system can be used as monitoring for anomalies relative to performance and expected behavior. It can be used to, to project different scenarios and so forth. So there's lots of different things that can be done with that. Uh, so digital twins have been used in industry for years. We're now seeing that opportunity to move them into biomedicine and into life sciences. So this is a little bit of a perspective on how they are moving into the biomedicine and into the life sciences. If you go back, interestingly enough, and I haven't really probed into this reference, but you can go back a long time ago, you can see things that would say digital twins in medicines has been considered in different ways years and years ago. But what's most important about this particular chart, and this is just information from PubMed, is that you can see that around 2020, you can see a rapid rise in the number of publications and references to digital twins in biomedicine. What's important about the slide as well is that those digital twins are not always about the patient. They're about digital twins in the biomedical industry. So there's increasingly use of digital twins in bioreactors and so forth. So in some of the manufacturing and industrial processes 
these are starting to show up, but they're also showing up with some of the, the biology itself. The important thing is that digital twins are being increasingly valued and pursued within the context of medicine. And it's important that they are because that builds familiarity within the community about what a digital twin is and what it can do in those situations. So when we start looking at oncology, what does that mean? Well, in a traditional approach, and this is putting it us into the context of both precision and predictive oncology, when you are testing whether a particular treatment is gonna be effective, you, re you recruit a cohort of patients that are similar enough to the conditions that you're trying to actually uh, test on that you can actually do that test. And that's what's represented by the numbers of patients on the screen that you see here. And to go along with that is some analysis to tell you that what the statistics and results are when you're doing that test of this particular treatment across a cohort of individuals that is essentially equivalent for the purposes of the study. And that works well, and it continues to, to serve the industry. However, when we start moving into a precision medicine approach, the cohorts get smaller and smaller. And in the limit, the ind there's only one individual that fits that cohort when you've made that precision medicine so tight that it is the individual. So the challenge is, how do you actually then determine whether a treatment is appropriate for that individual? You have to come up with an alternative approach. You have to come up with an alternative technology. And that's where the digital twin begins to come into play, which is what is the digital twin of that individual patient? that you can begin to use to do the same thing, to explore possible treatments, to make decisions on whether that treatment is going to be good for that patient. Doing those types of activities that you would normally have within the cohort, but you don't have a cohort because it is so specific to the individual, which means that digital twins for rare diseases have a lot of opportunity. We're funded by the National Cancer Institute, so we pursue the context of cancer as one of the drivers for this, but you can see the long-term perspective that we're making this transition from what has traditionally been done with a lot of patients in a small amount to compute to the other limit, which is an individual patient with a lot of compute. And we're in this transition phase right now, and digital twins are one of the avenues to move forward in that space. How do we look about developing digital twins? Well, digital twins ultimately are developed through an active learning approach, which is embodied in a learning health system. You take the available information about a cancer patient, you take the available data about the disease and the knowledge and collectively put that together and you can come up with a predictive model. You can say this is what would be best for that patient. That's the predictive model, but it has not necessarily been used or validated. So then it has to be associated with the patient care decision. What actually was done and then what was the patient's response to that? So you'll see the feedback loop in this. And that's why it becomes a learning system that's so important is to not only make the prediction about what will happen, but also monitor the result, whether it's favorable or unfavorable, because that is the information that's needed to continue to improve the effectiveness and fidelity of the models and build confidence. Few models are gonna be excellent when they are initially created. It is when they go through validation and use where they are improved and refined. And we, I've seen that over many years when I've been working in applications all the way from being graduate student and being first employed at Cray Research. The fidelity of the models improves over time as the use of the models is tested in real world conditions. And that's what we're essentially setting up here and recognizing it's a learning health system that ultimately will make this possible. So how do you build that? Well, what's interesting about the digital twins, and this is somewhat represented by the various pilot activities we had with the DOE, is that it's across multiple scales. And this is actually one of the, one of the things that I find very attractive about BSC is you are already working in these spaces. Your personalized medicine, center of excellence and other things are really, really all set up for the things that are going on with digital twins. You can go all the way from the molecular interactions that you're trying to understand, looking at cellular interactions, and ultimately embodying those into what are predictions that you can make about the patient. What's important is when you're making the decisions about a care decision for the patient, that you can trace back the information from that decision about the patient to the evidence, whether it's real world evidence or computational evidence that support that decision. And that ultimately tracks all the way back down to the fundamental interactions. So the whole process of putting this together is really a matter of taking many of the domains that are already underway and 
connecting them so that the evidence and supporting information flows between them so that you can have the evidentiary support for the patient track through what's the model for the tumor, what's the model for the cell, what's the model for the molecular interaction. And cancer being a heterogeneous disease, what are the implications not just for that individual cell, but the other cells that are both part of the tumor, but are also not part of this cancer at all. So having all of that supported by evidence, it's not an easy project by any stretch. It's one that takes a community. That's why we have the foundations that we have in that situation to put things together. The technical foundations is a little bit more about the projects in their current state with the DOE, the multi-scale modeling focusing on the RAS, RAF initiative, which has now extended its domain is called Admiral. Mosaic is the surveillance project that is really using AI to accelerate and integrate uh, that critical part of the, the, uh, the learning system, which is input about the cancer patient itself. Improve is a new project that's underway, which is uh, developing approaches and a framework to look at AI-driven models and understand where they're limited and what takes to improve them, whether that's improving the physical model itself or actually improving the data that is supporting the model. Those are important decisions to know. Adam will talk about a little bit, but it really is an intersection and applies um, for treatments. And Candle, we've talked about already. So when we put this all together, that simple diagram that we had earlier, which was really a, a, a context diagram, resolves out in a little bit more detail here. And you can see we have data from all different scales, both spatially, when we look at the patient level, things that are happening to them physiologically, all the way down to the molecular level. What are the molecular level interactions? All of those are available information about the patient. We don't necessarily yet know how they connect and how they relate, but they're all knowledge about that patient. And then we look at that information over time. So we have the ability to make observations over time in order to form that predictive model over time. That's one of the things that becomes very evident when you start doing modeling. If you're going to make predictions over time, you need data over time. So ultimately, that's one of the things that we come together with and make that happen. So what led us to some of the things that we're doing with the digital twins in this particular context? In, the, in 2020, we had an ideas lab. And if we all remember 2020, March of 2020, at least in the United States, is when we transitioned from working it together in a common building to working very separated in uncommon buildings. Uh, and that's what we ended up doing in 2020, in July, we had a, an innovation lab that was actually all virtual because of the state of the pandemic response at the time, where we asked the scientists to come together from many different disciplines to envision what they would do for cancer patient digital twins. Guess what? They came up with some things. What, before we get into the details about what they came up with, Here's a, a paper that was published uh, last year to give a little bit of a context for that. You'll see similar themes to what we've already talked about. But in that particular context, the cancer patient digital twin looks at the predictions that are made in the upper right hand that support that decision about the patient with their physician that moves into work, use within cohorts and clinical trials and ultimately feeding back as more insight into the patients in the upper left. There was a that manuscript was a um, a brief publication that was put out in in uh, Nature Communications. The implications of that manuscript are summarized here. It's really there's individual implications is that this paradigm allows you to look at what treatments would be best and improve decisions for that patient. Sometimes whether it's to treat or not to treat, it's going to be based upon decisions that you have uh, from predictive models and supportive models. There's implications that go beyond the individual because you can start doing things at population levels or cohort levels. It enables health systems to be potentially more, more um, uh, effective in, in what they're using and how they're using it and responding to real-time situations. Realizing that potential is going to take this integration all the way from the experimental data all the way up to the, the clinical information and bringing together these communities and the challenges, as you can imagine, data are going to be the biggest challenge. High quality, high volume, high consistency data across those scales and covering diversity of populations. That's one of the areas that's become very acutely uh, aware in the past uh, few years is that the population, the clinical data does not, not necessarily represent the demographics of where the data would be applied. 
And so understanding that implicit bias that that data may have simply by the, the population that was sampled for that data is an important characteristic. When we talk computational science and modeling, what's the domain of applicability of the model? What's the underlying data that supports that model? Is that model appropriate for the population or the case that it's being applied to? So that creates some of those integration challenges. How do we bring all this data together from communities that have not necessarily worked co cohesively yet? Integrating the models, getting HPC and standards are how we begin to define not only how things can be communicated, but standards for how things can be evaluated, knowing whether a particular model is appropriate and what it's appropriate for. What is the quality and reliability of data sets? These are questions that start coming up because those have ethical and community implications. Uh, if you are using poor technology in a poor way, you can imagine poor results. So having the ethical and community challenges, what do we do with digital twins and the knowledge that we have, uh, protecting against bias and securing privacy and overall governance are key things to happen. We also had a publication that was uh, published earlier this month that you can go look out at that essentially summarizes the, the remaining uh, parts of the, the presentation that we have here. We had 24 collaborating organizations work across five projects in that uh, coming out of that ideas lab. You can see that they were focusing on simulating and envisioning simulating pancreatic cancer patients to guide treatment there using self-learning platforms for personalized treatment of melanoma. This one with Paul Macklin was involved with. I understand he's a collaborator for many within BSC. Um, an adaptive digital twin for monitoring treatment response and resistance patient-specific multi-scale approaches for optimal treatment of small cell lung cancer and virtual cancer modeling. So these are the, the digital twin approaches that, that came forward. And so we, we start looking at these, and I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. Again, the manuscript is out there. Um, we're going to first start as, as man, uh, simulating a million uh, pancreatic cancer patients. Again, we were asking the, the groups to be audacious and uh, very far-reaching in what they wanted to do. The scientists there, what's important about the scientists, and again, we'll make the, uh, the slides available so you can get the details, is that they're very interdisciplinary. They come from different organizations and they pull things together in different ways, um, but they look at what they have as resources and pull it together. And the idea here, their cancer center, is to come up with digital twins that help them guide the treatment in this case, optimizing the treatment, which many times would be radiologically based, but really focusing on the pancreatic cancer is one of the challenging cancers to make predictions and forecasts on. But you can see a similar uh, pattern that we've seen previously about having the model, predictions, optimizing a treatment plan, and so forth. In this particular case, they would establish a database and they would simulate the population and look forward in, into these particular activities. A second one that we have is really monitoring the actual response. So the first one is looking at predicting the treatment. This one is actually focused on not only the treatment, but the response and resistance. And in this case, the goal was to develop an adaptive digital twin, one that's going to respond and predict the response to the initial therapy, monitor it. And then as that potential effectiveness would change, allow the decisions to be made to shift to another treatment, a treatment that would be expected to be more effective. And so their approach. Uh, has all of these different pieces into it. And it's going to be a learning-based approach where you have the models and they continuously learn from the examples and situations supported by the evidence across multiple scales. And that will really help the, the physicians make better initial decisions, but also monitor and update decisions as things go forward. So the team here, uh, representatives from many different organizations from Stanford uh, to, to other organizations as well. And you can see that there's a lot of diversity uh, in these particular uh, experiences. That's one of the key themes that comes through as well. Uh, and this is an idea of their, their workflow is to use lung CTs using an autoencoder and embedding to put things together and come up with what the treatment response is uh, and looking at how to apply that into various tasks. And so this is really an AI-based approach that's pulling these things together. A third one is now this is a dynamic multi-scale digital twin for lung cancer patients. And what we have is uh, led out of the North uh, South University of South Carolina, uh, Yale, Mayo, and other organizations. This one actually had an international participation, the University of Oslo, uh, pulling it together. The overview here was recognizing that we have multi-scale models and we need to 
find a way to put those together. And this was in the context of, of doing it for um, well, radiation, uh, radiation treatment. So pulling these together, you can see that the various radiation sources of information are used. They look at the image data, the clinical data, and come up with what they present as the uh, radiation uh, model that's going to be most effective in, in putting things together. Um, this, this next one is looking at the, the self-learning digital twin platform for personalized treatment in melanoma patients. Uh, this is the one that has Indiana University and Paul Macklin, uh, Institute for Systems Biology and Stanford University all involved with it. Uh, I think these are people that you are, are uh, some people you may be familiar with, Paul Macklin in particular. You're going to recognize this. This is essentially PhysiCell looking at it from a cancer perspective, looking at it from a melanoma perspective. If we mod model the individual cells, what are the interactions with them and how does that work over time? Uh, and uh, as, as you know, become very familiar uh, in this context, the, the images and so forth of the agent-based approach and how they evolve is here. And what, how can this be done to actually support decisions? How can you test treatments and see how they, they make impacts? And I know that Paul has continued to uh, advance the work that goes on in this area. The last one is my virtual cancer, which is gonna be a much more mechanistic based approach. Uh, led out of the University of Massachusetts Amherst and several scientists from other organizations as well, uh, pulling things together. And again, these are particular projects that were left to be designed and intended to say, what would be a 10 year effort and how would you get started? So it's not that these things are done, but these things are providing guidance on different approaches that can be taken. Uh, and this one is actually looking at using databases of information, very common aspect, the specifics of a given patient, but using stochastic simulations, machine learning and mechanistic models all coming together to build that coherent set of information that supports the decisions that are given to the physician. So what's unique about this particular is that it's integrating all these different model types to help actually build that digital twin. And the output of the pilot phase is that they actually develop some of the models and publish some results that you can look up here. But one of the challenges as you can expect, the lack of time course data for cancer patients became one of the limiting factors. And that's going to continue to be a case until we begin to have more longitudinal information for pa cancer patients. And it's particularly hard in cancer because once an individual is diagnosed with cancer, the motivation is to treat at that point. So one of the things we have to begin to do is to continue to have more persistent, more frequent monitoring, post-diagnosis and pre-treatment and then post-treatment. So those are the things that can help begin to address some of these aspects of it. So the summary points about all these different activities is right here, that each of the projects was conceived differently and started differently. Uh, they all joined the same ideas lab, but they took different directions. And that's an important lesson as well. There's not a wrong place to start. The thing to do is to start because it's gonna be an iterative process. We'll learn along the way and continue to grow. They took different approaches at the scales, the approaches to modeling and different types of treatments were explored. It wasn't all the same digital twin. There are different aspects. And that's one of the things that becomes very evident is that when we start talking digital twins for cancer, there's not a digital twin, it's many digital twins. And what are gonna be the digital twin elements, the digital twin components that are gonna be appropriate for an individual patient? That's one of the decisions that comes forward. Um, another aspect is the projects are used uh, AI collectively in different ways. Some of them were substantially AI driven. Some of them were using AI as, as to, to build coherence and, and uh, to derive features from, inter, uh, from key information. All projects wanted a framework, um, all wanted access to data. Not surprisingly, if we want to do that validation in the real world and we're working on cancer patients, we need that. And there's, there's simply a, a shortage of that. And collaborations were key to the long-term success. All right. So the broader community of the digital twins, this is a couple of short slides. I have the PERMED COE, Center of Excellence here, because it clearly is part of that community. Arno was up and helped present in a, a conference that uh, we had last week. A uh, tremendous conference and a lot of insight from many who are interested in how we build the digital twins. Uh, Comp Biomed in the UK, the Digital Twin Consortium, which is broadly International Cancer Knowledge Alliance, the NCIDOE projects, and many are involved in, in and have an interest in this. So there is a broader community that's there. All right, so that's the digital twins. 
We've got just a few more minutes. I got about five minutes and I'm gonna go through some of these things. I might take about seven minutes to get through it. But before we go any further, I'm gonna ask and take a pause if there's any questions. I'm gonna ask in the room, are we still following where we're going? All right, good. All right, because I'm going fast, but I want to make sure we're we're still with everybody. Okay, so now imagine that we we have these five projects, which are very audacious to imagine over the next decade. This is what we would want to do, and what do we need to get there? And that's what those projects have laid out, and you be, can begin to see and read about in that in the manuscript that was published uh, earlier this month. Go ahead. One, one question. Um, when we're talking about this, usually it's like not a, like a virtual patient, mm -hmm. like a real patient, and like this. Um, I think is at some point I understood something like like we're aiming to have like synthetic digital twins, like from one patient to have like several patients that would behave like this one patient that would be like different from, from yeah. So 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 one of the things that that conceptually you could go for, and it's particularly challenging to have a digital twin of a patient. There's a whole conversation that goes around that, but take that as, as the premise. If we wanna have a digital twin of the patient, we essentially are creating a model that has been updated with the latest information about that patient. So we now have a digital twin based upon the latest data that we have and the models that we believe are going to faithfully re represent their forward progression in, in the disease. <laughs> Right. So now we have that. So we can actually look at if we perturb that system, if we provide a treatment, we take that same starting point, but because we're using different initial conditions that are talking about the treatment, it may take a different course. We do use a different treatment. It may take yet a different course. So that's they have essentially that common origin of being the same digital twin. But we're doing is, is changing them slightly based on treatment decision to determine what we would expect would be the best treatment, potentially the best, best dosage, uh, potentially the best sequencing of treatments in dealing with that patient. And then ultimately looking at what those outcomes would be to help inform the decision. And as we, as one of the things that I've learned over time, and this became very evident when I moved away from working much more in computer science and chemistry into biology, is that biology is heavily driven by distributions of outcomes. Whereas when in math and, and physics and so forth, we're used to single values, things that are very narrowly peaked. Biology is very broad, is increasingly broadly peaked, right? So what we're looking at is when we do the initial treatments, what distributions of outcomes are going to seem to be most favorable? And to me, that's one of the big challenges. When we see a distribution of outcomes, how do we identify which distribution is actually better for the patient? We don't know that. I don't know that. So the, one of the things that goes forward as we see varied outcomes, depending on the types of treatments and initial conditions that we provide, how do we have confidence in the fact that there's a distribution of outcomes and not a single value, which we are so accustomed to? So does that help? Yes, yes. Okay, awesome. All right, so now we're gonna jump into digital twins for treatment op optimization. We may actually go fairly rapidly through this, but it's uh, important. So we've seen that slide before. This is where we can save some time. We're gonna skip it. Uh, we're going to put this into context that this is drug discovery uh, that we're looking at. The challenge that we started with the Atom project was how do we shorten drug discovery timelines from six years to a much shorter time? And really it's focusing on the areas of how do we shorten lead discovery and lead optimization. So when we started Atom uh, probably about seven years ago, uh, when we started talking about it, ultimately commencing about five years ago, it was this way. AI had not been used heavily in, in discovery. Things have moved forward very quickly to the point that we're now using AI to iterate and optimize uh, drug discovery. The Atom Network is, is a group of organizations that are involved with Atom. We have academics, industry, national labs, and all involved. And what the concept is for Atom is here. Right? And, and this is going to be another somewhat of a scientific or a, an approach inversion. Uh, the experiment is actually used to validate and generate information that supports the computational drive and model. So the exploration, the hypothesis generation, the validation is done in silico with predictive models so that we can iterate faster and cover chemical space more quickly because we can imagine molecules and see how they work in the computer without having to spend the time necessarily to validate them in the laboratory. There's trade-offs for that that, that become very evident. 
But the idea there is that through in silico processes, you can optimize and come up with strong hypotheses about what compounds would work and work effectively, not simply for one attribute, but multiple attributes. The gold or the yellow loop is actually where we have to get the real world evidence, the real world data that supports that. Because the computer predictions, as good as they may be, have to stand up to the real world observations. So they, it actually does both. And it uses active learning to reinforce each other. We do the multi-objective optimization uh, and we really are increasingly using human relevant models. This is that view expanded out a little bit more fully. You can look at it in the top middle. That's where we heavily use the predictive models. In the middle is where the generative molecular design is done. Is given those predictive models, what are the new compounds and new molecular chemical entities that would be expected to be performed more effectively? That's the optimization loop. So you're doing this a little bit of a tick-tock between let's make a prediction on a set of molecular libraries, update that library to a set of compounds that would be expected to perform better, test those, and repeat. So repeating that process, progressively making them better and better. The green loop is really how we begin to put some simulation in for real world parameterization. Computational evidence can help provide some insight. Envision molecular docking being one of those that comes into play. Is this solution even feasible? We can do some screening computationally without having to go to the laboratory, but then many times we actually want to go to the laboratory because that's again where we get real world data to support and retrain the models as well. So that's the overall process that we have. This is where the digital twins begin to come into play. The predictive models can be informed by the digital twins. The specific toxicity response may be related specific to the patient, their genomic characteristics and so forth. We don't necessarily have that yet, but it certainly has an implication there. The response to those can also be informed. What are the treatment windows that you're shooting for? It can be informed by digital twins. This digital twins supported by uh, systems biology can be used in the validation. And then ultimately, when we have the assays, what are going to be the most effective assays that we use for that patient? So the digital twin that we begin to use for patients, and this would be in many ways patients in general, actually have implications across this optimization. All right, so how do we do this? This is a, a quick set of the data that we saw. This is a, one of the early pilot projects where you can optimize across, I think in this case, there were nine different criteria that you can see in the magenta box that's in the upper, upper left. There were nine different criteria that were simultaneously optimized computationally. And what you see in the, uh, the scatter plot that you see in the, in the left-hand side is essentially initial data as things started out. But then the green is where things began to optimize. Right? So through a progression, you can see that, that there was an enhancement towards one of the properties while it was actually limiting the uh, impact. And this was an optimization of selectivity between aurora kinase A alpha and aurora kinase beta, uh, trying to make the beta more selectively preferential to the alpha so that you could target a compound into that specific target without having to worry about it in, in, uh, impacting the other target. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's the one we wanted to talk about. So when we start talking about the environment, we have the uh, predictive models. Uh, Ample is the workflow that we have. Ample is available on GitHub. It's publicly available. A key thing about Atom is that all of the ecosystem is, is built in the public interest. These are things that you can access. So Ample is the way we generate the models. Uh, MODAC is where we share the models and the data, so these are accessible. Uh, and Ample allows you to take the simple data set of chemical structures and associated property and build predictive models that are used in that aspect. This is just an example of some of the different predictive models that you can use. You can use multiple types of predictive models. The key point here, to have assays that will correspond to that phenomenon. That's essentially the real world data that you need to build the models. You can use simulation data, but obviously, ultimately, you, we would want real-world validation for that. Um, when we start putting things together, here's a, a slide that sometimes you have to get creative in putting the different pieces together. It isn't simply local properties of the compound, but how they interact with the system can actually give you better results uh, for the predictive property when you put things together. In the generative molecular design, which we call GMD, uh, we actually have several different aspects. There's components to it. 
There's an AI generative model that uses an auto encoder approach. There's different approaches for doing this that go beyond auto encoders like transformers and things of that nature at this point. The key point there is that you have a way to come up with new compounds. You evaluate them with the predictive models to see if they are better. And then you're using an optimizer that allows you to vary the, the different elements so that you can identify which compounds are gonna be better across the set of criteria that you're trying to actually impact. This is an example of another case where you're doing the optimization. You have about a dozen different criteria here and essentially an optimization using a weighting function of the different characteristics that you're trying to optimize for. Uh, this next part is essentially the simulation. What do we do there? We talked a little bit about using docking and so forth. So this is where you're using computational validation. Do the compounds make sense for the target, for example, doing uh, PBPK modeling, pharmacodynamics and so forth, things that you can do computers to help determine whether the, the compound or treatment would be effective. And it addresses many key questions without having to go to the lab. So you can do further scrutiny because going to the lab is gonna be expensive and much slower than what we do in the computer. But it is also much more valuable since it has that real world data support. Right. And then when we start looking forward, this is where the digital twin ties in again, the physiological systems that we begin to incorporate how those actually become part of the optimization process. And this gets us back to how do you do treatment optimizations with the digital twin, inform the models, select the models for that digital twin that are appropriate. And then you can use that same type of a process to essentially come up with optimized treatments for that individual. So the key takeaways we have for this whole, whole slide, community is embracing biomedical digital twins. I should say the whole presentation. Early biomedical digital twin efforts are drawing from successful insights from other digital twin efforts. So there's a lot of things to be learned by analogy and transfer. There's several levels of biomedical digital twins already in play. The digital twins themselves are part of collaborative efforts. There's a growing combination of technologies that make digital twins feasible, both in the computational side, but also the laboratory side. And then advances will continue to make digital twins uh, ever more practical and feasible. And with that, uh, my contact information is there. If you have interest in Adam, the best place to go for that top level insight is the Adam website, which is www.adamscience.org. I think with that, we can actually say we're done, go into a discussion, uh, and uh, have some Q&A. So with that, thank you. All right, we can do whichever you need. Talk to audio yeah, there. and share the conference. Come, maybe. Okay, can you hear us in online still? I guess so. Yes, uh, we can hear you. Okay, great, great. So, so, the, so the question is, if I if I paraphrase this correctly, which type of model are we talking about when we're talking about, in this case, a biomedical digital twin? Yeah. And 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 my my answer to that is, it's going to depend on what it is that you're trying to accomplish with that digital twin. It it is going to be dependent. It's going to depend on whether you have data, whether you have underlying theory that's very reliable, such that you may have a mechanistic approach. And increasingly, we're seeing the blending of both of the AI and the mechanistic approaches, because ultimately the criteria is going to be based upon how well it performs relative to the real world evidence, the real world data about the patient. And so rather than saying a priori, it's going to be one or the other, it's likely going to be a hybrid of different elements that work together as you start looking at what's going to be best to represent in the system for what you're trying to model and then update for the digital twin for the individual patient. So what are you going to find out by deeper Yeah, you, you could conceivably do that. I mean, 
as, as I've been talking with many people and having thoughts about this, this is a tremendously complex integrate integration uh, of different models that are doing different things. And at, at one scale, we may have competent models mechanistically, molecular level interactions, molecular dynamics may be wonderful, but at the next scale, we may not have that luxury of dynamics. So much of what the challenge is, is how do we make the coherence between what we observe at one scale consistent with what we're able to observe at another scale? And AI begins to serve as a way to begin to bridge that. Well, initially, we may not understand all of the relationships, but the correlation that the AI begins to provide may give us that confidence to build that coherence. And then as we push more into the causal understanding for those relationships, we may develop more, more ultimately mechanistic models that provide that insight. The long and the short of it, there's a lot of biology we don't know yet. And so we're going to have to work in an area that is going to continually need to learn and adapt. Great. When I did that, you want to start the yeah, I, I actually, and personally, I do envision a situation like that where it's going to take some time because ultimately when when you're presenting information to the physician, and I'm not a physician, so physicians would be the ones that are that are best to answer this, but based on uh, working with some physicians and other projects that have worked with physicians, they need to know that the information they're presented with has evidentiary support. Right? And so ultimately what we're doing is building a system that supports information to the physician that is based on evidence, whether that's real world evidence, which many of them do either by recall of what they know about prior patients, what they look up about patients that they don't yet know, or what we might do from a computational perspective that the computational evidence supports this. So in the decision as we, as, or in the presentation as we bring it to physicians to recognize it needs to be present, presented in a, in a manner that is going to be consistent, that it enhances the clinical workflow and clin enhances their activities. Right. What we put behind that can have increasing fidelity and complexity, but ultimately it must converge into supported evidence. And that's why it's going to take some time because it's not only developing the models and how they work together, it's how that evidence from each level actually integrates and supports to where you can make that decision. Yeah. I have one. You have talked about multi-scale longitudinal data. Yes. What do you, I mean, what is this? What is multi-scale longitudinal data? I mean, right now, yeah, yeah. all the data we get from patients yeah. destroy the sample yeah. in order to analyze. Yeah. So how can we make that longitudinal? Oh, that, that, that's, that's one of the, the, the big challenges, especially for an individual patient. How do you get multi-scale longitudinal data? Because in many cases, the longitudinal data is a, a difficult to get. But you can imagine some scenarios. So this is where we're going to go into uh, uh, what I'm going to say is, is someone who's not qualified to be answering this question, speculating on things that could be done. So when we want to get longitudinal data, the important thing is that it is information over time. Right? So you can imagine that you are taking an individual that may have been diagnosed with cancer. And how do you monitor them over time? Right? You can do that. Increase, you know, we do it at coarse grain. They go in for, for scans and you get a longitudinal record. Every six months, they go in for scans and so forth. It's a very coarse grain, but it is longitudinal. Now, when we want to get multi-scale, well, if we only use one modality at a time, we'll probably only get, a, get an observation at that scale. So it really ultimately comes down to doing monitoring at multiple observations at different levels. So you could be doing a blood draw at the same time you're doing the imaging. And now you have an, an opportunity to probe and get information about the patient at another scale, at another level than the, the standard one that you're using. So ultimately, as, as we've kind of looked at this, the frequency at which we are monitoring patients is actually very coarse grade. 
right now. And it's, there's a lot of reasons for that. And I'm not here to debate the, the whys and the wherefores, but just simply observe that it is coarse grained. It's every few months after treatment, there's a follow-up, for example. And usually it's not done at all depths unless there's something anomalous, right? So the, the goal would be to increase the frequency at which we're observing the individual patient, as well as the number of observations that we make that are appropriate for the different scales. That's ultimately how it develops. And with the advance that we have in 5G, wearables, things that we can do through uh, sampling blood and other things like that, there are a lot of ways that we can get more dense information over time that will provide a greater and, and more, have greater fidelity in what's actually happening uh, physiologically to the patient over time. Could the system also define when and what analysis to do? Oh yeah, could the system ultimately define when and what to do? Absolutely. I think for me, as a, and this is more of a personal perspective, and I, I should put in the qualifier that everything that I've shared is personal perspective, um, is that, yes, that's certainly one of the things that you can look at is the digital twin based on a physiology and a prediction could indicate when things should be monitored and followed up at a frequency. So if the cancer is anticipated to be slower growing, you may have a longer follow-up period, for example. And if the cancer is expected to be more aggressive, you may have a shorter follow-up. Those would be some of the things that would be you know, consistent with what is done today in practice, uh, but increasingly providing that. And then I think this is where some of the learning system comes into play is when the prediction isn't matching the observation is to make sure that that is captured so that it can actually be updated in the model so that the next prediction will have the benefit of that insight, right? And that's why it's so critical to look at this as really building a learning system so that the digital twin and the active learning on the models for the digital twin can actually continue to be developed systematically in the overall uh, process. Yes, sir, we what, 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 what is the question? Okay. No, there's Natasha has, has her. Is it very big time? When you say that it is going to take time, it's like, how, I mean, what scale of time? Oh, that, that's, that's a good question. What scale of time are we talking about? I think within the context of the digital twins, and, and I look at it, and I'll, I'll make a, a comment here. We used to talk, I used to talk about cancer patient digital twins, and the idea there was, the whole human modeling. We're inverting that a little bit now to digital twins for cancer patients, right? Because you can begin to look at the physiologically of, of the cell, the tumor and things of that nature, and still have an effective digital twin that provides evidence as long as we can present it to those who need that evidence effectively, right? So to answer your question on time, as we start seeing improvements in these subpatient models, we're going to see improvements in the, in the digital twin. So the time horizon is actually quite near to see some of those advances in the individual predictive models. And I would say in the next two to three years, there are lots of companies who are exploring what we can do with digital twins, whether they're real digital twins or whether they're simulations of patients, simulations of cells, simulations of tumors, those are things that, that are already happening. So it's a matter of, of coming together and making sure we have the supporting evidence that says this particular model can move from a predictive capacity to a pre prescriptive capacity. And that's gonna be heavily dependent on the validation and confidence that we put into the models itself. So that's one of the limiting factors in the near term for the whole patient monitoring. If we were planning with a 10 year vision, I would, one of the things that I've seen over the past few years is that since things are accelerating at, at an increasing rate, that's a linear progression of 10 years. It may be sooner than 10 years simply because as things build, it may shorten. We could see things as soon as five to seven years if some of the past trends hold through. So maybe we can go to Natasha's question online. Okay, hello. Uh, hi, Eric. It's a, it's a great talk. Thank you very much for this wonderful overview of, uh, of various projects and various people that have been involved. Um, from a computer science perspective, so as you, I'm sure, know, uh, underlying are very computationally hard problems, computationally intractable problems that you are approximately addressing. 
in various techniques. Basically, it's all based on some sorts of optimizations underneath. You have huge uh, volumes of data usually. Uh, luckily, you have high performance computing capacities to address that now. Uh, however, do you see, and you were, you were talking about this all multi-scale, you know, from one layer to the next, you need to some AI to make them coherent, et cetera, et cetera. And all of this is approximate, right? Do you see that maybe piling up approximation over approximation over approximation is going to diminish the quality of these models? Or do you maybe see some underlying mathematics and theory that will bring all of these um, um, this coherence together into some unifying model that in the end, in your know, seven or 10 years might be useful. Do you see that we need maybe a different kind of mathematics to unite all this? Or do you think this is enough, what you guys are already doing? Basically, you know, putting the pieces of puzzle together and hoping that in the end, you know, the cake will come out right. Okay, uh, I'll rephrase it for the, for the room uh, and I'll, I'll try and do it shortly, but the long and the, the short of it, and, and Natasha, correct me if I don't paraphrase it correctly. Uh, as what we've laid out using the current computational approaches, mathematical approaches, it all seems potentially doable, but it is based upon uh, a foundation of approximations in the models that ultimately may accumulate into challenges in the end when you are trying to have fidelity in your predictions. To answer that first observation and be completely aligned, I completely agree with you. That is one of the things that is, is completely a challenge with what we do in this, is that we have approximation in our implementations. To go along with that, we have limitations in our understanding of the biology as well. Right? So we have really two factors that are coming together here, is that we have limitations in our computational approaches, and we also have limitations in our biology. Biology is continually to learn, again, uh, there's insights being gained. So we're going to continue to have challenges. So the, the, the need is to understand we're going to have to learn in this, in this effort. So I, I do believe that, yes, it's, there are going to be challenges, but that is why the real world validation is so important to make sure that you have evidence coming out of real world examples, whether they're preclinical examples, clinical examples, or laboratory examples, things are validated. So you understand the limit of uncertainty that goes along with them. The second part of the question was related, do we think new mathematics or new approaches may be needed in order to bring coherence to this, to make this feasible? And the answer to that is actually yes. I do believe that we will need some new approaches to different theories and so forth that, well, they may be used in some environments, have not yet been applied in biology. So that's where the history of what's been done successfully in other industries and other domains will be important to bring forward. There's a lot of work that's gone on with multi-physics models that have been developed over the past many years. Are there lessons from multi-physics models that can be brought forward into multi-biology models that we can use? Is there new mathematics? More than likely there will be new mathematics that will be there because ultimately it comes back to providing confidence in the information that's being communicated to those who are making the decisions, those who are the stakeholders in the decisions. Is the current technologies and mathematics and knowledge sufficient? To some it is, we obviously have physicians that are treating people today. So how do we actually support the physicians more effectively with the new insights that we're ga gaining in the biology and translate those up into actual practice? So hopefully I've answered your question well enough to say, yes, I believe new things will be needed. I do not know what they are, but I do envision that a lot of the empirical observations have to be made coherent. Uh, efforts and potentially in causal reasoning, causal inference coming into play, where the AI may provide some insight that there's a there there, there's something that's consistent that is being regularly predicted by the AI observations that we put together, and asking ourselves what is the fundamental physiological or scientific basis that this predictive model seems to be embodying, and having the ability to support those. So that's where I come back to the question about, is it going to be AI driven? Is it going to be mechanistic driven? I think it has to be a hybrid of both because in some cases the AI will help us bridge complexity when we do not have mechanistic or scientific understanding. And then how do we begin to then incorporate the science, current level of scientific understanding into the approach itself, recognizing that we're 
going to be much more comfortable if we understand that there's equations behind it than simply this is what the data says. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great answer. Um, yeah, uh, I, I totally agree with you. Um, it's just do you maybe see some kind of a mathematics that is coming up from your experience rather than just basically these multi-physics models transforming, transforming them? Have you seen something promising in your personal opinion? In, in my personal opinion, I haven't seen anything formal, but I have to also admit I have not been pushing hard to look at what is coming up mathematically. But I do know that there's there's various theories out there. I know that Game theory has a lot of opportunity in different aspects. I have not personally looked at what opportunities game theory may have in some of this. I think ultimately it comes back as we work increasingly with the oncologists and the physicians. What is it that will be meaningful to them that they will have confidence in what we present? So I, I think there, there's that, that dual challenge of what's going to be feasible mathematically, but also what's going to be uh, supported and accepted um, in the medical profession. Thank you very much. Great answer. Thank you. Uh, I have just just for this one of your last slides. You have something uh, uh, after learning more relevant science and then human relevant more. What are human relevant more? Yeah. What's a human relevant model? Okay, so if, if you start looking at, at quantitative systems pharmacology, for example, human relevant would be more in line with pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics, but then looking at increasing levels of transport through various processes. So the one slide I, I went through very quickly was, what are the transport processes between the blood brain barrier, for example? So that would be an example of something that's much more human relevant rather than simply having a higher level, this is going to be neurotoxic, right? So we can resolve things more, more specifically to the individual physiology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I see, I see. So, because you are struggling with the following point. Uh, it's called this, the human in the loop. What is the in of human? Yeah, of yeah, human yeah. Human yeah. 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 that, that, and that's it. The last few days, and particularly in this type of, yeah. So the 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 question, or or as we look at it, is have we looked at, or have are we exploring what's the role of the human in the loop? And uh, to be quite honest, in that context, we will almost always have humans in the loop as we go forward. The question is, at what part of the loop are they going to be involved? Since we're in the very early stages and the domains are, are many times well separated, we're going to have to have humans in the loop simply to adjudicate the, the communication as we go forward. And so you can see a progression over time that humans are involved in making sure that things are appropriately entered in terms of data, mm -hmm. but also making sure decisions on what may be the most appropriate combination or ensemble of models to use is appropriate. So humans are always going to be in the loop at some level, but I think over time we're going to see uh, that change to where we get to the, the, the system. And again, I don't know what it will be, uh, where the humans are in the loop, whether they're in the loop actively or passively, I don't know. But uh, I do think that, that humans are in the loop because judgments and, and so forth are going to be key and the, the the value propositions the values that we all bring are going to be key as we start using digital twins we made a little bit of reference to that what are the ethical implications of the digital twins when we, when we start bringing in ethics we bring in humans in the loop so as we start looking at ethical use of models ethical selection was that an appropriate data set all of those things will ultimately re have humans in the loop and in particular early on, because there is so much that we don't actually have as a firm foundation yet, where the humans are critical to help make that foundation possible. Thank you. I, mean, I think we should discuss it later. It's an interesting topic. Obviously, humans are implicated. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's 
Thank you very much You're welcome. For, for your presentation. And so we'll, we'll continue the discussion with the program. Sure, absolutely. And thank you all for coming. See you soon. Yeah. Oh.